about monarch butterflies. Last year, we were involved with a program called Monarch Live. There's one now. If you want to know more about monarchs, you can go to the web address on your screen and you can watch webcasts to find out more about monarchs, how they overwinter in Mexico, why milkweed is so important to them, also the threats that they face, and what you can do to help. So today, we're following up with that program with Dr. Chip Taylor, and he's the director of Monarch Watch. So Dr. Taylor, can you give us an update well, I about sure can. monarchs? There are monarchs all over the place. I we, can tell. We, we, had one, we had one flying through the garden here earlier today, and there's this really? big annoying one that's flying around <laughs> us right now. I mean, this, this is, it's kind of amazing. I don't think I've ever seen a monarch that's quite that big. I don't oh, either. my goodness. Here now, it is again. Also, before we start, remember all of you out there, if you want to buzz in with questions about monarchs, please send them to the email address on your screen so that we can answer some of those later on. All right, let me give you a little update on what's going, been going on with monarchs for uh, the last year. Last summer we had a really cold summer and it was really hard on the monarchs. They didn't produce a lot of uh, young butterflies and so the migration was a little bit low last year and the result of that was that the overwintering population was at an all-time low down in Mexico where they overwintered just kind of west of Mexico City. So that population was of great concern because we're worried about the winter weather because we've had some harsh conditions down there in the winter and we, we were worried that a small population facing a, facing a harsh winter would mean a, a poor return this spring and that's exactly what's happened. They had a period down there in the first week of February which was just devastating. Just like we've had rains here with 15 inches in a few days mm -hmm. uh, down in Tennessee, they had those kinds of rains down there and it really devastated the population. So we've been quite concerned and the number of butterflies coming back this spring has been pretty low but fortunately, really very very fortunately, we got really lucky the spring conditions in Texas this year have been extraordinary. Right. Right? Yeah, right. The temperatures have been low and this has allowed the butterflies to really get a good start. There's been a lot of milkweed in the area. Uh, there's been a lot of bloom out there so the butterflies can get a lot of nectar. And it looks like they've gotten off a of good first generation because we're seeing first generation butterflies come up all throughout uh, the eastern United States right now. So we're very positive about what's going to happen the rest of the summer. That's a great update. And you know, the last segment that we watched was about bee hunt and how people could be, students can be citizen scientists and conduct different science projects like through Discover Life. So I know that Monarch Watch involves tagging. There's another one now. Yeah. So what exactly is a tag and why do you tag? Well, we tag the butterflies to learn a lot about the migration. One of the things that we got started doing, I said the butterfly is just all over the place. It just can't get rid of this wing. I'm going to have to catch this one and tag it, you know, before we're I all bet. done. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good idea. <laughs> anyway, uh, what we're trying to do is learn a lot about the migration through the tagging. And with the tagging, uh, it has been very, very successful. We've had people all over the country tagging monarch butterflies, 37 states, five Canadian provinces. Uh, this has generated literally thousands of recovered butterflies that we're analyzing now to determine a lot of things about the migration. And we've learned a lot about the timing and the pace of the migration. It is at how fast they move down the country. We've learned a lot about where they originate and what the probability is, what's the chance of their actually getting to Mexico. And so, and we've learned a lot about the differences from one year to another. So it's been a very, very productive program. And we've engaged literally tens and tens of thousands of people in this tagging program. And people love it. They love to go out there and catch those butterflies and put the tags on us and help us learn more about this migration. Well, is this something that students, classrooms, and even communities could become involved? Yes, we have lots of nature centers involved, lots of zoos involved, lots of schools involved, and we've got a lot of families involved. I, I, once, had a, I once had a family, a, a, a father call me up, and he said, I need some more tags. And I said, well, I just sent you tags. He said, I know, I need more. I said, well, why do you need some more? I mean, you got a lot of help. He said, yeah, I got, I got my four-year-old's helping me. I said, what do you mean your four-year-old's helping you? Yeah, he says, I go out there and catch them, and then she tells me whether they're boys or girls. <laughs> That's great. It's great to work together like that as scientists. That's right, yeah, right. It's definitely. easy to do that. So, what have you and other scientists found out through this whole tagging process? Well, we've learned a lot about how this migration moves across the country and how predictable it is from one year to the next. So if you ask me a question while I'm at my computer, I can tell you when the monarchs are going to arrive next year at a particular town 
in the United States. That's amazing. That's totally amazing. Now, is it really difficult to tag monarchs? No, it's it's really very simple. It's very easy for it's very easy to tag monarchs. It, it really is remarkably easy. In fact, you know, I'm going to catch this big monarch if it I keeps think going we around could. here and put a tag on it. You know? Yeah. Well, can you show us how to tag monarchs? Then? Yeah, I I can do that. We'll right. we'll uh, let's see if we can catch this big one first, and then we'll. Uh, um, if the big one will just go around behind like she's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see how we're going to tag the monarchs. Well, first of all, i got to catch them. And you know, to catch a butterfly, you've got to be pretend you're a praying mantis, right? Oh. You don't want to chase after a butterfly to catch it, right? Because if you chase after a butterfly, it's going to see you, and it's going to fly very fast, and it's going to have an escape flight to get away really easily. So you don't chase a butterfly. Rather, what you do is that you come up behind it and below it with a net. You know, and you kind of take half steps toward it. On, you kind of keep, take half steps toward it, and then what you do after it has come really close, you take that net, or if you're a praying mantis, and you grab it like just like that, right? You just grab it like that. And I'll hold still, hold still. Let's now I need, a, I need a really big tag for this oh, butterfly. Oh my goodness. Tag. All right, let's get this tag on. We put the tag on on the oh. hind wings just like okay, that so looking, there looking. we go there we go all right i think we're gonna let this one go it's just oh, too let's frisky let it go. Woo. all right gone <laughs> now we can was, track you know her. you know it's hard work tagging butterflies you see that that I was did. that was that was a struggle <laughs> but <laughs> i bet everyone can do it no so. it's a lot easier than that in real life well let's have those real butterflies okay all right so it's not really hard to tag a butterfly but it is a little tricky to catch them all right okay so let's see what we can do here. Can you hold me that? Absolutely. Hold that for me? All right. Now, I've got a butterfly here. And Arwa's going to tell me whether this is a boy or a girl. All right? And here, we're going to put that in there. And then we're going to take the tags out of here. Now, are you going to tell me whether that's a boy or a girl? Is that a boy or a girl? A boy because it has a patch. Yeah, it has a little patch right and there. The girls and the, and the girl one doesn't have a doesn't have that patch, right? Okay, so we're going to hold, and I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm trying to show you how to hold the butterfly without hurting it. All right, so you can hold the butterfly with the leading edge of the wings like this with thumb and forefinger, or you can take your thumb and forefinger and hold it right like that, and you're not going to hurt the butterfly. And now what we want to do is we want to put the tag on the butterfly, and we want to put the tag right there. See, doesn't that look like a mitten? See, it looks like a mitten, doesn't it? So we want to put the tag right on that mittens-shaped cell right there. And then I'm going to put that tag right there. And we're going to hold it down, right? Now I'm going to put my thumb on that for about two seconds. One, two, all right? Now the adhesive on that tag has gone right through to the membrane of the wing. All right, now what we have to do is we have to write this down, all right? So you got your pencil and paper here? So what we have on this tag is we have three letters, right? What do those three letters say? MPM. MPM. And what's the number say? 499. 499. Yeah, MPM 499. So we have to write down MPM 499. And then we have to write down whether this was a boy or a girl, right? And you told me it was a boy, right? OK, that's what we have to do. Whenever we catch one of these butterflies and tag it and release it, we have to record the data, all right? So that we know when and where the butterfly was tagged and what the number was and whether it was a boy or a girl, right? That's what we have to do. And that's how we get this information, all right? That's great. So we're gonna let this butterfly go later, but if anybody wants to see a girl butterfly, I can probably pull one out. That's, a, that's another boy. That's another boy? Yeah, this is a girl here. See the girl. This is a girl. A girl butterfly. So, down. can students get more information somehow? Yeah. You know, they can just go to our website, monarchwatch.org, and they can learn all about tagging butterflies. Now, what is that? that it's a girl, it doesn't have a pouch like the boy. That's right. Good, good for you, Arwa. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, and Dr. Taylor, because this segment, uh, Pollinator Live, is about pollinators, can we talk about how butterflies are pollinators and how they act as pollinators and if monarchs are really important pollinators? Well, you know, butterflies are 
very flitty, like this monarch that we had going around here, yes. just kind of bouncing around. And they're not, you know, they, they kind of bounce around from flower to flower a, a lot. And while they visit a lot of different flowers, uh, they're not as efficient as bees are. But they are pollinators nevertheless. And the monarch butterfly visits a pro probably 200 species of flowers in the course of its annual cycle. So it does play a role, particularly in the pollination of a lot of fall flowers. Absolutely. And can you discuss how butterflies are different from bees in the plants that they pollinate? Yeah, there are a whole class of plants which are called butterfly flowers. And butterfly flowers tend to be different from bee flowers in that the butterfly flowers tend to have a very dilute nectar. What that means is it has very low amount of sugar in it. But you know what else it has? It has amino acids in it, the building blocks of protein. And the building blocks of protein are very important to have in butterfly nectar because they don't use the pollen for food. <laughs> Strangest monarch and so, I've ever seen. How are can you discuss how bees and butterflies see? Well, the bees and butterflies don't see like we do. They don't see very precise images. They see things in a very fuzzy pattern. They have rounded eyes, right? So their eyes are composed of many different omatidia, diff many different facets, many different lenses. And so they don't have the resolution we do. They do not see sharp images at a distance. So what they have to do is they have to move through the environment in a kind of a zigzag sort of fashion so that they can refine the, how the image is moving across their eye okay. so they can determine how to home in on a flower. And so that's the way they do it because most of what they see looks like blurs and blobs and kind of misshapen things. I mean, if we could see what a bee actually sees, we wouldn't recognize most of what it is. Now, I think we're going to see what you look like uh -oh. to a bee. Now, it doesn't show it exactly, but the bee see kind of out of focus and with a wide angle. So that's how people are seeing you right now. So I look like a blob, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I've, I've been told that. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can you explain that flicker fusion frequency? That's like yeah. a really interesting term to Yeah, the, the flicker fusion frequency. Now try saying that fast about five times. You can't do it. <laughs> All right, but what flicker fusion frequency means is that the number of images that you might see before something becomes continuous motion now, when you go to the movies, you're seeing something at 32 frames a second, 32 images a second, and it looks like continuous motion to you. But if we took a bee to a movie, it would see 32 distinct images. In fact, if we were to show a movie to a bee so the bee would see something that is continuous motion, it would have to go at about 200 frames a second or maybe even higher. Otherwise, what the bee would see would be flicker. Like it a strobe. Do, yeah, like a strobe okay. light. It would be, be, be a flicker. So this flicker fusion frequency is very important for how an organism moves through the environment. The faster your fish and can't say that flicker fusion frequency, the better it is. That is, the higher it is, the more easily you can move rapidly through the environment. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. But there's a really funny thing about this. You can have a very good ability to see things that move fast, right? And this helps you detect predators if they're coming at you rapidly, which is why I tell children don't chase that butterfly because they can see a rapid movement across their eyes but they can't see something slow. Okay. That's and that's how a praying mantid makes his living, right? Mm -hmm. Is that's a how you caught that yeah, butterfly. Yeah, that's how I caught that butterfly. You, you move really slowly, and then at the last second you move really fast, okay. right? right? Yeah. And that's how a lot of predators make their living, because they take advantage of the fact that the flicker fusion frequency does not allow something to see something that's moving slowly. Okay. All right, well that's great. And also, now we want to learn about an update, about how the monarchs are doing. I know they go a long way to Mexico and overwinter there. So can you give us kind of an update on what's going on with those guys? Well, we, we've kind of covered a lot of that because what we we're talking about is that they're, it looks like they're coming along really fine this year because they had a really good spring uh, down in, uh, and, and yeah, see there's one now. We had a, a really good spring down here in, in uh, in Texas and uh, we saw a monarch here earlier this morning. So they're coming back pretty well and if we have normal summer conditions this year, we can expect the population to rebound and see a reasonably good migration this fall. That's wonderful news, excellent. Now, we're in about mid-May right now, so where are the monarchs in their migration cycle? Well, the monarchs have um, pretty much uh, moved throughout the middle portion of the country. They haven't moved up into, say, Minnesota yet, although there may be one there today. 
but we haven't heard reports of Minnesota, Wisconsin. I guess there's been one report out of Michigan. There are a whole bunch of reports out of southern Ontario. So they're they're moving up into the total uh, over, uh, summer breeding range, and it looks like they're going to be able to do this within the next uh, couple of days, in a couple of weeks. Well, and if any of these northern states have seen a monarch, you can buzz in and let us know that you've seen one today. And so. I know that many students and other and teachers and other people, communities are really interested in monarchs and they really want to help. So what are the biggest threats to monarchs? Well, you know, we're facing a lot of threats to monarchs as we're facing a lot of threats to other wildlife and the loss of habitat's a big one. We're losing 6,000 acres a day in this country just to uh, do the development. Uh, there are lots of changes in agriculture that have had severe effects on wildlife and particularly monarch butterflies. So in order to deal with all of these changes that are going on in this country, what we've instituted is a, what we call a monarch way station program, which is encouraging people to create habitats for monarch butterflies, to bring milkweeds into their gardens, to bring nectar plants in their gardens. Because what's happening with the result of all of the development that's going on is that the places where monarch butterflies can live and lay eggs and raise you know, the caterpillars, they're getting to be greater and greater distances between those locations. And so we want to fill in a lot of the gaps. We want to have monarch way stations in as many places as we can. And so we're encouraging people all over the country to grow milkweed in their gardens. We're also going to get involved in big restoration projects where we're going to try to involve departments of transportation around the country to get them involved in restoring roadsides uh, with pollinator friendly habitats, particularly monarch friendly habitats, so that we have a lot more habitat out there for monarch butterflies. So that's the one thing we need to do. And the other thing that we need to do down in Mexico is that we need to plant trees. Mm -hmm. We really need to plant trees. In fact, all over the world we really need to plant trees because we're faced with climate change and certainly one of the ways to deal with climate change is to grow a lot of vegetation, to pull out that carbon out of the air, uh, to create sort of what they call a carbon sink. And the best way to do that is fast growing trees. And in Mexico we have a lot of opportunity to have some very fast growing pine trees that we could plant in those areas where the monarchs overwinter. And we have to compensate for a lot of the deforestation that's taken place down there. Well, that's great. So we can incorporate way stations, monarch way stations that provide habitat. So that's food, water, shelter, and space. Right. Yes, and we can all plant trees. So we can all do our part. That's right. Excellent. Absolutely. Very good. Now, I hear you're involved with some other really cool research involving monarchs and that you sent them into space? Yeah, we sent them into space. And we had, we had a wonderful opportunity last fall to send monarchs up on what we called STS-129. This is a monarch I'd like to send to space right now. It's kind of <laughs> spacey. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Anyway, we were able to send uh, three monarch caterpillars uh, up on the uh, shuttle to meet with and dock with the International Space Station in November. And they were in a little capsule, a little box about like this. And we had an artificial diet in there, and they fed on the artificial diet and they matured all the way. I was afraid they were going to float around in there, you know. Yeah, You're up yeah. there without very much gravity. Right. I mean, really no gravity. I mean, that thing is moving at 17,000 miles an hour. You know, you got this big arc around the planet, so it's like you're in a free-falling elevator forever, right? And you wouldn't want to be Yeah, you, know, you wouldn't want to be there. All right. No, no. So <laughs> so so um, we were concerned that we'd have floating caterpillars. And then we were concerned that they wouldn't be able to pupate correctly, that is to make a chrysalis. But they did that. They made the chrysalis just fine, except they couldn't attach it. Mm -hmm. And then we had these floating chrysalises in there. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're never going to be coming out of a floating chrysalis. But they did. They came out of the floating chrysalis. Now, it, it took them about 15 minutes, four or five times as long to um, expand their wings as they would normally. But they did it. And we were just going, wow, you know, they had all of these difficulties of dealing with the lack of gravity, mm -hmm. but they compensated for them reasonably well. And so we consider this thing to be a very great success. And you know what? The best thing was we had 450 schools involved. It was terrific. That's excellent. And yeah. so now they were up in the International Space Station and they were confined to a small chamber, but what would have happened if they would have been released to fly? Well, I don't know, but you know, I'll bet you some of them would have flown upside down because you have no sense of where where gravity is, you know, the, uh, no up sense of gravity. And so uh, right, left, up, down, doesn't make any difference. So I think some of them would have flown upside down unless there was a light that they could fly to. And if there was a light they could fly to, I'll bet you they would have righted themselves and flown right to the light. 
Well, that's great. All of this information has been just incredible, and thank you so much. And now it's going to be some time to take some questions. And let's see, I think we have Arwa right now. That And remember, you can buzz in at any time to send in your questions, so keep on buzzing in to the email address on your screen. And this question is from Mrs. Abraham's fourth grade class from Baker Elementary in Bentonville, Arkansas. And they participated in the Monarchs in Space program. Terrific. So, can you reveal to us what is coming next for us to experience with the Monarchs in the classroom? We'd love to be involved and our students never forget the impact this program has had on them. Well, that's wonderful. That's a very nice thing. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to have some kits available for schools that will be just like the Monarchs in Space kits that we sent out to 450 schools. And what they, we can use is the, the kit and they can follow the development of the larvae in the kit just as it occurred on the space station, right? So we, you know, it won't be the same as doing it in real time, sure. but they can copy that and get a sense of what's different in their classroom from what was different on the space station. Wonderful. That sounds really interesting. And I see, thank you, Arwa. You're welcome. And, and we also have the monarch butterfly with some milkweed. Oh, that's our that's favorite great. plant. Yes. I, I'm surprised mm. there aren't eggs all over it. Look at yeah, that. Probably no, no, so. We'll yet. be soon. All right. Well, here we have a, we have a swamp milkweed, and uh, that's a very good plant for monarch butterflies. Okay. All right, and then our next question is from Mrs. Allen Boyle's classroom at Wow, Conaquinensing <laughs> Valley Elementary. And do you think that monarchs are dying so much that they will become extinct? Well, you know, we have to worry about all the life we have on the planet because mm -hmm. we're the dominant species on the planet and we're doing a lot of things that aren't favorable to a lot of the species out there. And I think we, we really have to take advantage of what we know about monarchs and say, you know, monarchs are kind of symbolic of what's happening. And, you know, indicator what, species. Yeah, it's kind of an indicator species, and monarchs don't seem to be doing well right now. But, uh, and, and what are the reasons for that? Is it the climate? Is it the a loss of habitat? What is it? And you know, what the monarchs are telling us is that there are changes taking place out there, and we better pay attention because all of that life out there supports us. Right? Yes. We're not independent of all of that stuff out there. All those pollinators feed us mm -hmm. and they keep all this natural vegetation alive around us. And that natural vegetation keeps all the birds and small animals and everything else alive around us. So we want to pay attention to the little things out there because those little things support us. And the monarch is simply symbolic of all of these other representative species. So the monarch butterfly and other pollinators are sending us a powerful message. You bet. This question comes from Carol in Laurel, Maryland, and she wants to know, what is more important, the specific host plants or the genetics of the monarchs? Oh, I would say, you know, what's more important, the genetics or the host plants? I'd say it has to be the host plants. And so we, we really have to have the right host plants. And so what we want to do is emphasize putting the native host plants mm -hmm. in the right places for the butterflies. That's what we want to do. Uh, we don't know a great deal about monarch genetics, but it appears to be fairly similar to a lot of other insects and a lot of other butterflies. There doesn't seem to be anything really special, uh, special about the monarch uh, uh, genome or about the monarch genetics. So it's, uh, it's, it's a typical insect. It has a lot of genetic variability, and yet that genetic variability does not have anything to do with its survival uh, or its extinction so much as the plants, having the plants, having the habitat does. Which depends on us. Right, which yes. apparently does depend on us. Yes. All right, thank you, Arba. Our next question is from Riverview Elementary in Farmington, Minnesota. And the question is, how do monarchs know how to travel such far distances without getting lost? You know, that's a good question, and I wish I knew the answer to that. And I love to have this question coming from Farmington, Minnesota, because that's where I grew up learning all about monarch butterflies in that very in that very area and you know that's a question that scientists are pursuing continuously how do monarchs navigate how do they set a course that gets them to mexico and we don't know that yet we have a lot of clues as to what they're doing but we don't have the specific information we need to determine why or how they set a particular heading because the monarchs coming out of Kansas in the fall are going at about 210 degrees, which is 30 degrees west of due south. But if you go down to Atlanta, the butterflies are going about 260. 
So each portion of the country, they're going in a different direction. And those directions are appropriate to get them to Mexico, but we don't know how they're doing it. And boy, would we love to have that answer. We sure would, and we'll just have to keep conducting research and being citizen scientists to be able to figure all of that out. That's right. right. All right, thank you, Ottawa. This is from Mrs. Huck and Joe's eighth grade class from Saraville, New Jersey. Why do monarchs have an orange color? Uh, that's a good question. Now, what monarchs are, are aposematically colored. <laughs> now, that's a big fancy word. Yes. So it says, aposematic means warning, warning coloration, all right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to warn something, warning. not to fool with you, you get orange, black, and usually yellow, right? Mm -hmm. Orange, black, and yellow. And that's why monarchs have this color, because they're trying to advertise the fact that they feed on plants, like this one, that have cardiac glycosides in them. They have compounds in them that are toxic or semi-toxic. And so if you were to eat this monarch butterfly, no thank you, if you eat this monarch butterfly, it you make you sick, mm -hmm. all right? So you don't want to do that. So yes. the butterfly, in effect, tells the predator, Why? I'm not good to eat, folks. Just stay away. Okay, very interesting. And I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Arwa. Now, this is from Ajin International School in Chicago, Illinois. Can bees and butterflies transmit diseases to plants or humans? We don't think so, but there is a possibility that viruses could be transferred from plant to plant by some, well, certainly by some insects. I'm not sure that butterflies have ever been implicated in transfers of viruses or any pathogens to plants. Uh, there's no indication that any of these things can be transferred to human beings by bees or butterflies. That, but there may be some evidence that, a, that a bees will transfer some pathogens from plant to plant as they're visiting them. Thank you. We have right. time for one more question. And this is from Conley Elementary in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Is it safe to touch a butterfly or will that hurt the butterfly? Well, it depends on the butterfly. And what you want to learn from somebody like me mm -hmm. is how to hold a butterfly without hurting it. All right? That's important. Yeah. And if you grab it the wrong way, it bounces and wiggles around and you'll ruin its wings. All right? Oh, so you don't want don't to do, want to do that, that, right? No. So you want to grab the butterfly just the right way. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. We really appreciate you sharing all this incredible information with us today about the monarch butterflies. And, you know, this has all been very interesting. I know many of you out there um, are interested in um, answering more questions later on in the program. And we thank you for bringing us up to date. So keep in buzzing in with your questions. And we'll have time later in the to answer more of your questions. Also, teachers and adults, educators that are out there, please go to the website on your screen and fill out that online evaluation because your feedback is extremely important to us to help us improve our programs. And also, you will receive a beautiful pollinator poster. And also, we'll plant one milkweed plant for each survey that we receive back. And we'll plant those in a local school here in Washington, D.C. or in one of our USDA People's Gardens. And also, we'll enter your name to win some great prizes from the U.S. Forest Service. We'll select 10 respondents, randomly selected, to win a box of goodies, which will contain pollinator materials, woodsy owl, and smoky bear educational materials. Also, we all know that what we can do is plant gardens to help pollinators. So don't forget about your garden grants. Just log in and go to visit for the $500 garden grant. So if you apply, you may be one of those that is able to receive that garden grant. We hope that you'll stay with us and buzz back in 15 minutes to talk more with our experts about what you can do to help pollinators and how you can attract them to your schoolyard and your backyard. This is Tamberly buzzing out for Pollinator Live.